Hello and welcome to another edition of Advocate with Albert Abkiri. And today we have with us the uh, chairwoman of the California Republican Party, uh, Jessica Patterson. Um, uh, thank you, Ms. Patterson, for accepting our invitation and coming into our show. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me, Albert. It's great. Uh, it's the first time that I'm doing an interview with you. We, we've, we've met a number of times and we've had a good, very good conversation. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about your background first? We always do an introduction initially and then we'll, we'll dive right into a, a whole bunch of stuff that we have. So tell me a little bit about your background, please. Yeah, I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, most of my childhood was spent in Hacienda Heights. When I was in high school, my family moved from Hacienda Heights to Montebello. And it was in those uh, drives from Montebello back to Hacienda Heights um, that I really became a Republican. Um, my mom knew that the schools were better in Hacienda Heights than they were in Montebello. So we took that drive every day, all five of us kids in her van. Um, we're a practicing Catholic family. So each child had to do a decade of the rosary on the way into school. And um, it was tough to, you know, get up early every morning and try and be the first one in the shower so you got hot water <laughs> to drive um, that extra distance to go to a good school. And um, so this was something that was triggered in me very early on in life. And on those car rides into Hacienda Heights every day, we actually passed by a Republican headquarters. And I asked my mom one day if I could go in and volunteer there and both of my parents were Democrats. And so they were a little surprised, but they let me do it. And I met a wonderful woman there. Her name was Martha House and she took me under her wing and she empowered me and she made me feel important to the cause of what we were doing. And it led to really a career in politics over the last 20 years. Yeah, House family is a, is a big Republican uh, pillar in California. So. Oh, yeah. They absolutely yeah. are. And there is no doubt in that um, everybody knows Charles, everybody knows Martha, and um, they are wonderful people to be both friends and mentors to me. Uh, what does it feel? Uh, let's uh, tackle into something I've been wanting to ask you on my TV. Uh, how does it feel to be the first Latina? And how does it feel to be the first woman, uh, both at the same time, uh, being elected uh, to the California Republican Party just to preface that by saying, I know it wasn't easy to get where you needed to get to, uh, fighting the no, to be so. It's been the greatest honor. It truly has been, Albert. It, this wasn't something that was in my life plan. Um, I, you know, as you know, and maybe some of your viewers don't know, I worked in the field side of politics. I was an organizer um, putting together grassroots organizations throughout our state. Prior to be to running for chairman, I ran an organization that recruited and trained candidates. I worked a lot in candidate development. I was always a behind the scenes person and I enjoyed my anonymity and <laughs> I loved my work. Um, but with that last job in particular, I was out there and I was recruiting candidates. And um, I learned how to recruit candidates from uh, House Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy. And whenever you found the perfect candidate that um, you know is perfect for that district and they're giving you all the reasons why they couldn't or shouldn't do it um, i always leave them with two questions if not you then who and if not now then when and so for the first time when people started talking about my name as the possible successor to senator jim brulte which both figuratively and literally are huge shoes to fill um, i had to ask myself those two questions if it wasn't going to be me, then who? And if it wasn't going to be now, then when? And there were people, you know, former assembly leaders who had already written our obituary, who had talked about how the California Republican Party was dead, how it was unsalvageable. And I just don't believe that at all. And the work that we have done over the last year has been so amazing, Albert. And it is full proof that the California Republican Party's comeback is on track. And it truly has just been a great honor to have been the first. Um, but I can promise you, the way that the California Republican Party is going right now, I'm not going to be the last. That's good to hear. Um, just a quick question in reference to how the Republican Party has changed since you've taken over. Uh, fundraising yeah. has gone up. 
Um, you know, we have our vice chairperson is of a Chinese immigrant. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that, there's a huge change and a new wave in the Republican Party. I would love to. And that's one of the things that I talk about a lot when I'm out on the road. Because, um, well, I am, you know, first Latina, um, first millennial, first woman. Um, to talk about our, our board as a whole is phenomenal to me. We have about 23 board members for our state party, and um, almost half of which are women. We have four Latinos on the board. We've had two openly gay men on the board since I've been chair. We have an African-American, a Taiwanese immigrant as our vice chair. We have a kick butt Punjabi Indian American lawyer you probably see on the news channel, Tarmeet Dillon, as our uh, vice chair, excuse me, our a national committee woman. And so I tell these things not because any of us ran as being the first anything. I tell this story because when the mainstream media and Democrats try and talk about what the Republican Party is, it's usually old, white, and male. And when you see our board, it is a slap in the face to that type of narrative. So it's been exciting to watch our board as a whole, but we have been doing some really fantastic things um, on the communication side of things. Um, this is something that I believe is truly um, an easy thing to do. And we've really um, uh, focused on it to be successful at it. I'll give you a comparison. In September of 2018, an election year, the California Republican Party sent out 50,000 emails. In September of 2019, a non-election year, we sent out 3.5 million. We've doubled the size of our contacts. We're talking to more people and at a greater rate. So making sure that our message got down to people. I go to Sacramento about once a week and I tell you, Albert, when I go up there, they speak in a different language. They talk in bill numbers and committees and they talk about chairs and they talk about authors and co-authors and subcommittees and amendments and who's gonna lay down and who's gonna take a walk. And you go down to Costa Mesa or Calabasas, they have no clue what AB5 is and how it's going to affect everything from the dirt you haul off of your front yard project to the next Uber or Lyft that you get into. So making sure that the people on the ground had the message of what's happening in Sacramento and how that's affecting their everyday lives, that was hugely important to us. Our fundraising, it has been going fantastic, even in the midst of this uh, crisis that we are in right now. Um, our fundraising, especially online, is doing incredibly well. Um, we raised more money online in 2019 than we did in 2017 and 2018 combined. Um, we're at a thousand percent increase. Um, and so it's really critical that we are constantly talking to people about things that are important to them, but it's also critical that we are talking about what we would do differently. It's not enough to be the party of no. We can't just say the Democrats are doing it wrong. We all know they're doing it wrong. If they weren't doing it wrong, we wouldn't have a mass exodus from our beautiful state. We have to say what Republicans would do instead. And so that is something that our legislative leadership and our legislators have done a fantastic job and given us the opportunity to point to when we're trying to rebuild this California Republican Party and have this California come back. That's, that's uh, good to hear uh, the changes. I've, I've been involved in politics, as you know, with Sean Steele for a very, very long time. And, and, and it's, it's refreshing to see uh, new ideas, new faces, new um, things coming into the party after 25, 30 years. Um, I want to talk to you real quickly before we go on a break on, on uh, the idea of farm teams and how we're building our party from ground up instead of from up down, so to speak. Uh, can you just talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind? Yeah, and really, I think it has to be a two-pronged approach, right? Um, making sure that we do have that support from the bottom up is critical, but we also have to be doing the right things at the top with leadership. And so um, I, as I mentioned before, ran a candidate training and recruitment organization, California Trailblazers. We have since brought that in-house. And so um, being able to make that available before it existed outside of the party. And so it was run as a 527 state PAC. Now that we've brought it into the party, we can make it available for candidates at every single level. 
to make sure that they have training and resources that they wouldn't otherwise have. It's critical that we do this because that is what's going to lead us to having more success at, successes at the state legislative level and at the congressional level. And if we're not doing a good job in every single community showing up, we're never going to be able to bring balance back to California. I don't see balance as picking off one legislative seat here and there at a time. Um, the quickest way to balance here in California is making sure that we have a candidate that can run and win in 2022 for the gubernatorial seat. That's when we will get to, to balance the quickest. And so um, making sure that we're showing up in every single community is critical to that, making sure that we are engaging. Um, you know, I never use the word outreach. That word outreach to me implies that you have to reach out to someone. We did have to do a better job about talking about what our issues are, but with individuals who are already Republicans, representing these communities and a lot of it's done at the local level where they haven't run with that r behind their name yet yep i agree with you 100 percent. why don't we do this why don't we take a quick break uh come back and talk about some some just uh, recent issues and and covid 19 and everything else that we have to deal with um just to hold on for uh, for two minutes uh we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back We're back again uh, today. We have a guest, our guest is the California Republican Party chairwoman, uh, Jessica Patterson. Um, Jessica, we're talking about um, recent events. <clears throat> Everyone's lives have changed. I've always tell people 9 11 changed our lives forever when it comes to flying and traveling. Uh, COVID 19 has changed our lives on a daily basis. Um, what is the, what steps are you taking? Uh, talking about first uh, closure of the beaches by the governor. I want to talk about that first and then we'll go into everything else that's happening. So could you yeah. talk a little bit about what the CRP is doing on that? Yeah, so first and foremost, um, I really want to convey that our concern is with our, your friends and our friends, families, um, their health and safety. Um, that is first and foremost. You know, we are going through, as you said, an unprecedented time an unprecedented time that we've never seen before. And um, you know, it's critical that we keep the health and safety of everybody in the forefront. At the California Republican Party, similar to many businesses and organizations around the state and country, uh, we moved to uh, remote work very, very quickly. And it was actually the work that we've done over the last year that we were able to build up what we were doing on the data and digital side of things that made our switch, I mean, it was like flipping on the light switch. And um, it, the seamless transition was just fantastic. And it was really a testament to our staff um, because we were able to switch over so quickly. So we've done over 200 trainings online since the stay at home order has been in place. Um, we've trained thousands of volunteers and that's from the 25,000 that we have recruited uh, over the last year. So we're very excited about the work that we continue to do at the California Republican Party. And um, it has certainly um, made it a lot easier because we transitioned very quickly. Um, now we're seeing a time where, you know, very early on, both the governor and the president, for the first time in a long time, were playing incredibly nice with each other. Um, you know, they both were complimenting each other. They both were doing what was needed for the people of California. They both spoke on that and it was very refreshing. I have always said, we are at our best when we find ways to work together. And these are two men that were in a Twitter fight with each other <laughs> multiple times. Oh, okay. And so to see them both rise above it and really take care of what needed to be taken care of for Californians was absolutely necessary. And I was glad that they both stepped up. Over the last several days, I think we've seen an incredible overreach by our governor. And in fact, you know, we have two special elections that are going on in California uh, a week from today. Both of those special elections are 100% mail-in ballot elections. There'll be a couple of voting centers that are open up, but every single registered voter was mailed a ballot, the postage is paid for, 
So literally, if you received your ballot, you fill it out, all you have to do is send it back in the mail. This governor will not comment on whether or not ballot harvesting is legal. Now, Albert, you know, this governor has commented on us closing our businesses, closing our schools. He says that, you know, we shouldn't be visiting our mothers on Mother's Day. And he can't tell us whether or not it's safe for strangers to be coming to our house and picking up ballots. It's not, it's a political ploy. And the reason he doesn't wanna say it is because he doesn't want to affect ballot harvesting in November. And he's playing politics with the health and safety of Californians. Now, if he believes that ballot harvesting is safe, then why aren't we opening up the rest of our economy? Why aren't we visiting our mothers on Mother's Day? Um, and you know, we've seen people's uh, you know, reaction to the governor closing down Orange County beaches. And I think he opened up a few more earlier today in Orange County. But um, you know, he talks constantly about uh, you know, these decisions being data-driven. I think they're data-driven. I think that there was a poll that told him people are not gonna stand for this. And that's why these beaches are being reopened. Um, but I think that <coughs> it's critical. If we wanna make sure that our economy doesn't suffer any more than it already has, we need to let people get back to work in a safe and responsible way. And with a state that's as diverse as it is, as California is, we cannot have a one size fits all solution to this. Um, I was doing an interview with uh, Dr. Massey, Dr. Erickson uh, yesterday. And uh, there are two physicians who actually were on Fox News. They've been on a number of other uh, TV programs. And- uh, At a Bakersfield, they, right? At Bakersfield, they run yeah. urgent cares uh, all over the state. and. Um, they basically are data driven. They're data driven, and their data shows that uh, you know we are now overreacting to uh, the the COVID nineteen. That uh, influenza and very very severe uh, flu would have has the same exact effect as what we see today. Um, and as you know, uh, CDC actually lowered the numbers down to thirty nine thousand just from COVID nineteen. If you go to their site. Uh, so I, I just don't understand the need to keep the businesses closed, especially when the, uh, you know, prescription for depression and anxiety medication is up by 80%. Uh, you know, child abuse and spousal abuse is substantially higher. Suicides are higher. Businesses are going bankrupt. I think that the side effect of not opening our businesses and leaving it the way it is, is so much higher than the actual COVID-19 itself. Uh, I'm pleased that we have these, uh, you know, phase twos uh, starting as soon as Thursday. Um, I am pleased that they are going to be moving. And I'm hopeful that these numbers continue to trend down where there is no other option than to get back to a full blown economy that we had prior to this, um, because it was the greatest economy that this, uh, this country has seen in a generation. Um, so we need to get back to that. And I'm incredibly hopeful with the phasing in that this will happen sooner and quicker rather than later. I agree with you and, and I hope that happens uh, again sooner than later, especially with schools opening so I can uh, have a 16, 16 year old at home and uh, he's going crazy not being able to get a driver's license and <laughs> not being able to go and see his friends. Um, let's talk about uh, what is the future of California Republican Party under uh, the leadership of uh, Jessica Patterson. How do you, what do you see us in five years? What do you see us in 10 years? Yeah, I mean, I think that the California Republican comeback is in full swing. Um, I traveled before, you know, we got the stay at home order. I traveled the last year all around our state, over 60,000 miles. And I can tell you from those travels that, you know, we came out of November of 2018 and it was a dark time for California Republicans. And in this last year, People are filled with hope, they're filled with excitement, and just the right amount of being pissed off. They are ready for a change here in California. And I think that we have every opportunity to take back some assembly seats. We've already picked up one before we even head into the general election. Assembly District 38, that's currently held by a Democrat, will be won by a Republican in November. We have two Republicans going into that general election. We're excited about that. 
we have an opportunity in a week from now to um, hold on to Senator Jeff Stone's uh, uh, Senate seat with uh, Assemblywoman Melissa Melendez holding on to that Republican seat. We have an opportunity to pick up a currently held Democrat congressional seat with Mike Garcia uh, in about a week um, to fill out the rest of that uh, uh, vacancy left by Congresswoman Katie Hill. So we have some great opportunities. And if we're smart about it, if we continue to put forth good ideas that really can make a difference in people's lives, I see us getting back to a place where we, are, we have a statewide candidate that can run and win that gubernatorial seat and where we continue to be that golden state that we once were. And I think that we have a huge opportunity. Well, uh, I hope so. And I hope that we continue uh, moving forward and hopefully we'll see some major changes within the next few years uh, within the party and within, in, in the state. Um, I wanted to thank you for joining us. I know how busy you are and I appreciate your time and, and hopefully we'll, we'll talk some more uh, in the near future. That sounds great. Thank you, Albert. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for, uh, for staying with us. We'll be back again uh, next week with another interview uh, and we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you.